This is such an important event. Thank you for braving the weather. I hate to think of the hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of shoes exposed to the elements tonight. <laughs> but I appreciate that additional sacrifice for the cause. I want to uh, acknowledge our governor who is here, who has provided great leadership on our community's issues. Thank you for being here, governor. And I want to acknowledge my great colleagues in the House and Senate. Senator Schumer will be here later. Congresswoman Maloney's here. Congressman Nadler's here. They've been fighters from the very beginning. Thank you for being here. I want to thank Speaker Quinn. Love, Christine. Love, Chris Quinn. Thank you for your amazing leadership and friendship. You've been such a, a champion to work with, and I just want to thank you personally. I also want to thank Senator Duane and Assemblyman O'Donnell, not only for their leadership on marriage equality in Albany, but for their constant friendship and support. And I see several friends here from the Assembly and Senate here tonight, and I personally want to thank each and every one of them for their yes vote on marriage equality. And from the bottom of my heart, I want to thank Joe Salmonese. Joe and the entire Human Rights Campaign Board and Steering Committee have been here for me from the beginning. And from the first time that I met with Joe, not only did I know I'd have a friend, but I knew I had a partner in him and went in the HRC to fight for the battles that matter the most. Thank you, Joe, for your amazing advocacy and leadership. This is such an important time in our country, a time of crisis for so many. However, a time of crisis does not mean that we should shrink from the fights that matter the most. The human rights campaign is leading those fights, and I join them. Freedom from discrimination is a basic right that all Americans must enjoy. HRC is an organization and an advocacy group that has undertaken the massive job of education, advocacy, outreach across the country for three decades. HRC's work here in New York is instrumental in the fight for marriage equality, rallying public demonstrations of strength, making thousands of calls, sending emails and letters of support for equality. They continue an important tradition that in many ways started right here over 40 years ago in the streets of Greenwich Village. Now 40 years after the Stonewall riots, we have moved from a spontaneous uprising against a government-sponsored system that persecuted sexual minorities to millions of Americans, both gay and straight, who believe that government should not sponsor barriers to equality based on one's sexual orientation or gender identity. As a woman, I understand what marginalized voices and parsed lives are like. I grew up watching my grandmother, and she knew that women's voices were important but undervalued, and that her role in society was limited by her gender. So she organized women and she brought them together to gain strength, and their voices were made powerful by their unity in numbers. Even in my own political life, my first opponent called me just another pretty face. Of course I said thank you. <laughs> the fight for equality is something that we have seen from America's earliest days. Despite the fact that our country was formed by those fleeing oppression, the struggle against inequality based on religion, gender, race, sexual orientation, and gender identity continues today. As Senator Burris correctly noted in the Don't Ask, Don't Tell hearings last week, he said, these fights are all connected. He said, at one time, my uncles and members of my race could not serve in the military. 
And we've moved now to the point where they're some of the best and the brightest that we've had, generals, and even now the commander in chief is of African American heritage. Like all movements for social justice, this work has been long, it has been hard, but we have been filled with the fight against callous indifference, indignities, and hatred. And but we are now seeing, because of that fight, a profound shift in America. We had a major vi victory recently. I was very proud to join Senator Kennedy as an original co-sponsor and vote for the Matthew Shepard and James Byrd Jr. Hate Crimes Prevention Act. As everyone in this room knows, this hate crimes legislation condemns poisonous messages that some human beings deserve to be victimized solely because of their sexual orientation or gender identity. Justice demands that we will no longer stand for it. Just as we celebrate victories and milestones, we must recognize that the fight continues on. And I believe that it is impossible to assure equal treatment under the law without marriage equality. Now, New York, New York should be the next to take on marriage, to, to take the lead on marriage equality. Although we did have a setback this year, we will continue this fight and we will win this fight. And just like the fights that are taking place in state capitals all around this country, it was continued this week on Capitol Hill. Lifting the ban on Don't Ask, Don't Tell is not only necessary for achieving equality, but it is necessary for ensuring that our armed, ser our armed services remain the best in the world. I I, I am leading this fight because I believe strongly that Don't Ask, Don't Tell is a threat to the men and women in our, national, in, in our armed services and a threat to our national security. We can no longer afford to handicap our efforts because of ignorance or hatred. The armed forces are experiencing shortfalls in mission crit critical personnel, especially in the midst of fighting ongoing wars and is losing highly, uh, highly qualified personnel under this corrosive policy. And just for those who don't follow this in detail, since the beginning of this policy, we have lost 13,000 personnel. We have lost more than 800 in mission critical areas, which means we cannot easily replace them. We've lost more than 10% of our foreign language speakers, particularly in languages like Farsi and Arabic, which we are desperate for those skills in fighting terrorism on every front. This policy has not only corroded our military, it's also cost us an enormous amount. It's been $300 million in recruitment and placement, replacement costs alone. This policy not only harms our military readiness, but it undermines our national security. And from my first meeting with Lieutenant Dan Choi, when he told me about the lies that he was forced to endure to serve his country, I understood that Don't Ask, Don't Tell was not just about end strength and readiness, but it is about our nation's integrity. I recently launched a, a, a website on my Senate site for service members to post their personal stories, how this policy has impacted their lives, how it changed their decision about whether they could serve anymore. And some of the testimonies are so inspiring and break your heart. But one testimony in particular was from Sergeant Johnson. And he said, he said, honesty and integrity are everything in the Army. I felt that if I was lying, I didn't have it. I wasn't serving with integrity. I felt trapped. Lying is not the way of the Army. I felt I was violating regulation. He said, as long as Don't Ask, Don't Tell exists, 
There's a hole in the integrity of the entire military. Now, if you watched those hearings last week, you would have cried because we never expected to get the testimony that we actually got. Admiral Mullen said, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the leader amongst many in the, in the military services, he said, no matter how I look at this issue, I cannot escape being troubled by the fact that we have in place a policy which forces young men and women to lie about who they are in order to defend their fellow citizens. For me personally, it's unbelievable. He said, he said, for me personally, it comes down to integrity. Theirs is individuals and ours is an institution. Now the hearing this week was a very important first step, but we have a lot of work to do. And we will lift this dangerous, discriminatory, and damaging policy out of our government. Tonight, I am announcing that I plan to introduce an amendment to the budget that will bar the use of funds for the enforcement of this policy. Now, Don't Ask, Don't Tell is just one of the important fights that are still ahead of us. We have to work to repeal DOMA. We have to pass the Employee of Non-Discrimination Act with gender protections. Now, what is LGBT without the T? We have to fight for the T. Now, I am confident, I am confident, while the political expediency of hatred and the comfortable assurance of ignorance will continue to exist, we can overcome these obstacles and we will create opportunity and equality for all Americans. Like those great New Yorkers at Stonewall, we may be blocked from the first attempt, but we will not give ground and we will continue the fight.